everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of Allegheny County Council to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of prayer or silent reflection. <clears throat> Thank you. Please be seated. Jared, please take roll. Ms. Bennett. Here. Mr. Bekowski. Here. Mr. DeMarco. Here. Mr. Dewar. Here. Ms. Filiaggi. Mr. Fatulis. Here. Ms. Hallam. Here. Mr. Klein. Here. Mr. Macy. Here. Ms. Nacaretti Chapkis. Here. Mr. Palmieri. Here. Mr. Palmasina. Here. Ms. Prizio. Here. Mr. Walton. Here. President Katina. Here. We have 14 members present. Proclamations slash certificates. All the proclamations and certificates will be read into the record this evening. 12699-23. A proclamation honoring in memoriam the life and legacy of Ernest Ricci Jr. and declaring June 1st, 2023 is Ernest Ricci Jr. Day in Allegheny County, sponsored by Councilmember Katina. 12700-23. A proclamation honoring in memoriam the life of Nicole Denise Hogan and declaring June 15th, 2023, Nicole Denise Hogan Day in Allegheny County, sponsored by Councilmember Nakarati Chapkis. 12701-23. A proclamation recognizing and congratulating Dr. Tim Steinauer upon the occasion of his retirement from the Mount Lebanon School District, sponsored by Councilmember Dewar. 12702-23. A proclamation recognizing and congratulating Dr. Mary Beth Irvin upon the occasion of her retirement from the Mount Lebanon School District, sponsored by Councilmember Dewar. 12703 or 12703-23. A proclamation in support of the organizing efforts of the staff union of Pitt, sponsored by Councilmember Hallam. 12704-23. A proclamation recognizing the 2023 Castle Shannon Memorial Day celebration, sponsored by Councilmember Paul Mary. 12705-23. A certificate of recognition awarded to VFW Post 803 of Clareton, sponsored by Councilmember Paul Mary. 12706-23. A certificate of recognition awarded to American Legion Post 75 of Clareton, sponsored by Councilmember Paul Mary. 12700-23. Certificates of recognition presented the 2023 Banner Communities of District 2, sponsored by Councilmember Filiaggi. We'll now have public comment on agenda items. We have many, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, I will mention the two names, and then if the second name can just come up and stand at the podium as well, and then they can go right up next. Our first is going to be Nazir Mohammed, and the second is John Hanrahan. No Nazir. John? All right, good evening everybody. I will keep myself excruciatingly brief because I know there's plenty of comrades here to say the same thing over and over again. So I'll say, first of all, I am in favor of the, uh, uh, the bill to raise the minimum wage for county employees. I am happy to see that there are no exceptions for seasonal employees, for part-time employees. Rising tide lifts every single boat, not, no exceptions. And then also, uh, I was very disturbed, as, as many people were, by the uh, capricious decision to close the Smithfield shelter. Uh, I'm encouraged to see that there is uh, some sort of bill to at least clarify uh, so that closures can at least not be so capricious, but I, I want to see more uh, from this council to see, uh, to figure out what, what happened, why it happened, and what we can do to prevent this in the future, and also hopefully keep Smithfield open longer. People need these beds. Thank you. Next up is Bobby Hillman, and Carl Redwood will be following. Next. Madeline McGrady, Gonzalo Bird Munoz. Next. Garrett Wasserman, Devin Getz. Next. Stephanie Raywald and Jennifer Konikowski. Next. Rick Schwartz. Hey there. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Mr. President. Esteemed members of council, I was going to go through all this. I can't. I can't read it. Every time someone comes up with papers, I sat back there. Your eyes roll back in your head and you wait. I just wanted to speak in terms of, uh, I'm going to call it by what it was known as before, living wage bill. 
uh, even though it was done under a different circumstance, your compromise bill is pretty much exactly the compromise living wage bill uh, that was offered and not voted on in 2001. And, and there were 10 sponsors on that bill. And one of the sponsors, he, he's still with government today. But um, I don't really have anything else to say. I'm very, very proud that you joined it. It was one of the two things that when I ran for office, I was really uh, concerned about and wanted to do. And I, uh, I look forward to you passing it. I know that everyone has had a lot of time to study it. And I believe in my heart that everyone here believes in family sustaining wages and, and fair treatment. So thank you. I look forward to your decision. Thank Bye. you. Next up is Eddie LaFleur and Ryan Stranko will follow. Next. Phoenix Sunfire, Erica Brusselars. Good day. My name is Erica Roki Brusselars. I live at 721 James Street in Pittsburgh's North Side. I'm a 23rd Ward Democratic Committee Chair and also the Democratic nominee for County Treasurer. I'm here to speak in favor of the the wage bill. I support paying workers a living wage. MIT's living wage calculator indicates that a single parent of one child needs to earn $33 an hour for it to be a living wage. Passing this will, bill will be an important step on that path. Our workers deserve it. They deserve our respect and they deserve a fair wage. I keep hearing that our county has 7,500 employees, but I looked at the publicly available March headcounts and it's much closer to 5,000. We have a huge number of open positions, partially because people are not paid enough. We lose them to the private sector. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Next up will be James Kobalak, followed by Amelia Farmery Rochelle. Dan Grisbeck, followed by Kirsten Rocky. Jacob Klinger, followed by Tanisha Long. All right, hi, my name is Tanisha Long. Um, today I wanted to speak on the Smithfield Shelter, and I wanted to speak on some things that I think are missing people's attention. Um, an article came out in which uh, Don Costa and Rich Fitzgerald talked about what closing Smithfield would look like. And one of the things that was mentioned by Costa was that if these people who are unhoused didn't want to receive the services, then they could go to jail. And a lot of what we're missing in the closing of Smithfield is that by displacing these people, a lot of them will have increased interactions with our legal system. A lot of them will have increased in interactions with our jail, our jail that's currently on a lockdown. A lot of them will no longer receive the services that they had access to when they were not incarcerated. The problem isn't whether or not we have a Smithfield shelter. The problem is the county's inability to provide wraparound services, access to resources. Um, it's our lack of interest in housing people who are unhoused. It's our prioritization of businesses. Smithfield isn't the problem. The problem is that we have a county executive who is beholden to the interest of PNC Bank. The problem is we have a county executive who's not interested in interacting with county council before making big decisions. I'm surprised that we don't have a system in place already that makes it so that one man cannot, can decide whether or not we keep a building open. I think that's insane. You have this many council members and none of you are involved in the decision to close Smithfield. This is Schumann all over again and we need to have a system in place that stops this. But more importantly, we need to recognize that the people who are most affected by this are Allegheny County residents. Unhoused and unsheltered people are Allegheny County residents. Unhoused does not mean unemployed. Some of these people are also taxpayers. Some of these people have been failed by other services that 
should be providing them resources, that, ooh, it beeps, should be providing them resources that allow them to overcome drug and alcohol addictions. A lot of these are parents, some of these are children. These are people caught up in the system who may have been your neighbor at one point. And when we remove them and we decentralize their housing and we put them in places like Moon, McKeesport, we're also ripping them away from whatever familial systems that they've built. We're taking away whatever stability they have. And I think we're far too comfortable with the idea that cleaning up Smithfield should involve disappearing our neighbors. I'm not comfortable with that. And I was surprised last, what, two weeks ago when I was here and no one on county council was aware that this was happening until a tweet was released. I'm not gonna say who did it. However, what I hope is that you would take the bold step to step in and stop this from ever happening again and also speak out about what's happening now and prevent the closing of Smithfield Shelter. Thank you. Next up will be Alex Criego, followed by Lauren Hergert, followed by Dan Grisbeck. Hello, my name is Alex Criego. I'm the VP of uh, Allegheny Labor Council. Um, I rise in favor of uh, Bethany Haldem's bill to uh, increase and pay workers uh, a decent wage. Right now, the state's still stuck at 7.25 an hour, and I hear a lot of back talk that it will stop labor from negotiating contracts. I see no way that that would happen, even if the state increases to a $15 minimum wage, then therefore you're telling me that that would stop labor from negotiating contracts. It holds, it's a mute point, it, it holds no water. But anyway, just to make it clear, if people are paid a decent wage, then therefore, they will be paying more in taxes, the city would be getting more in revenue, and so therefore, everything would fall into uh, a nice, nice budget, okay. But other than that, like I said, I'll be brief. Have a great day, thank you. Lauren Hergert. Okay, Dan Grisbeck, followed by Zachary Michaels. Evening, Council. My name is Dan Grisbeck, G-R-Z-Y-B-E-K. I'm resident of Bethel Park. I'm coming today in support of Ordinance 12345, TAC 22, to increase the minimum wage for county employees. This minimum wage increase will serve to both attract new employees to the county and retain existing ones. With rising prices of food, housing, and utilities, the ordinance will give our county employees a stronger ability to care for not just themselves, but also their families without having to pursue a second or even a third job, giving them more bandwidth for their contributions to the county. A recent study that was actually just released last month by the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment found that raising the minimum wage over $15 per hour resulted in increased labor participation, something we desperately need right now. The study also found that providing a greater minimum wage to lower income workers served to invigorate the local economy as lower wage workers often live paycheck to paycheck and spend a higher percentage of their earnings. Given that the county executive has already expressed his intent to veto this ordinance, I'd like to address his stated concerns in case any of you may share them. The first concern is that the ordinance violates collectively bargained contracts, which have already been negotiated. However, the language in this ordinance is clear that it wouldn't apply to any contracts that are already in place and would only set a paid floor for future contracts. The second concern that was expressed um, is this legislation is outside of council's purview. While your solicitor has already provided a legal opinion that it is within your purview, I would also like to note that the county executive himself was in favor of a similar effort to create a minimum wage for county employees back in 2001 when he was on council, indicating that he understands that you all do have this power. Finally, the county executive expressed concerns about the cost of the legislation, to which I would like to point out that between 2019 and 2022, he gave raises to his top staffers that were almost double the entirely, entire yearly minimum salary that's being proposed by this bill. To complain about paying a more liberal wage to our county employees that are only gonna be making 18, 19, $20 an hour, while his top staffers are getting an extra $75,000 per year is pure hypocrisy. I implore you all to stand with the workers of our county government, Vote in favor of this ordinance and override the county executive veto when the time comes. Thank you. Zachary Michaels followed by Jack Wyant. 
Daniel Gavin, followed by Christopher George. Sarah Chandler, followed by Sean, oh, I'm sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Dan Galvin. I am an educator, active community member, and Army veteran who deployed with the 4th Infantry Division during the Second American War in Iraq. I'm here to speak in opposition to the closing of the Smithfield Street Shelter. Housing is an issue of importance to me, having spent much of my childhood enduring multiple evictions and even spending a period of time living out of a tent. Food, clothing, shelter. These are basic human needs. I would assert basic human rights. I would argue that the purpose of a government structure is to provide basic human needs for its people and a method to attain them without resorting to undue burden or desperate measures. This is the sign of a healthy society. This is what truly makes a region livable, as without these three things, one cannot live. By removing access to one of these key elements, shelter, just as the heat of the summer is arising, as they're installing air conditioner units in the building, the county is consciously making the choice to shift the burden of basic survival needs of 600 people a month from the collective responsibility of our society back onto the individual, and that is unacceptable. Homelessness is not a failure of an individual. It is a failure of a society that has disregarded its central reason for being, not to line the pockets of developers, but to ensure the safety of its people, all of its people. Councilperson Prezio and Hallam's efforts to raise the minimum wage are a huge and important step in assuming that responsibility, and I hope this body acts to take that step to ensure that working people can afford to keep a roof over their heads. But for those who have already been not denied that right to, for, that right to a place to call home, this representative body has a responsibility to provide its people with some semblance of what has thus far failed to properly safeguard. For those who refuse to acknowledge this central responsibility, know that the community is watching. We will not turn away from our responsibility to support and keep secure every last neighbor, especially those in the most dire need. This is the collective responsibility of society, food, clothing, shelter. We will uphold our responsibility, and I hope you do the same. Thanks for this time. Next up, Christopher George, Sarah Chandler. Sarah. Is Christopher next or am I next? Sarah. Sarah, you can go, that's fine. Okay. Are you Christopher? No. Okay. What's your name? You're after me. Sean Gray. Okay. So, hello, my name is Sarah Chandler, and I'm here to speak about the closure of the Smithfield Shelter and the state of affordable housing in Allegheny County in the city of Pittsburgh. The only reason I'm not homeless is because my family is wealthy, and I am on good terms with them. My family is well educated, and my mother is a social worker. But when I became disabled at the age of 22, I had to start relying on disability payments. The house I currently live in is not wheelchair accessible. I need a significant amount of help getting in and out the front door. I looked into my options for alternative housing. When I spoke to a social worker at the Pittsburgh Center for Autistic Advocacy, they told me they are simply referring wheelchair users on disability to homeless shelters if they lose their current housing, because the only accessible housing has wait lists that are two to six years long. Becoming homeless does not change your position on these lists. Of course, if you're lucky, you end up either institutionalized or in rehab. Not a rehab for substance abuse, but the short-term rehabilitation facilities designed to help people transition from a hospital back to home after, say, a bad fall. Rehab can't release you until you have a safe living environment to go to. So places designed for short-term stays are being filled with people who have no other options. So when your parent or spouse suffers a stroke, they'll end up where there's an open facility, even if it's in Beaver or Butler County, rather than a place where you can easily visit them. This is how it stands now, without the closure of the Smithfield shelter. The city of Pittsburgh has dropped the ball on housing, to put it politely. Thousands are in the same situation I am, and thousands are worse off. My parents did everything right, but they are not allowed to pay my rent or subsidize my housing. 
My ABLE account and special needs trusts are also unable to legally pay for my housing. It takes just one accident or the unlucky roll of the genetic dice for someone to end up here. The county's housing crisis will touch your lives, either directly or indirectly. It probably already has. This is happening because Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh refuse to invest in affordable housing, and the closure of the shelter have chosen to make the city's homelessness crisis worse. Thank you. Sean Green, followed by Eliana Bagel. Hey, y'all. Smithfield Street Shelter is not a space that is a shelter by night and non-existent by day. I spent the last two weeks of my life outside at that shelter every day with my friends, because they are my friends. I invited the community down there to talk to them because the city, the county, DHS, everybody that's elected in this entire region has failed the people by failing to inform them. The first day I got down there, I learned that no one knows about the shelter closing, not the folks that depend on it, not the people that can change it, and, and surely not the people that work there. That is a disservice to the people. I went up to Second Avenue because everybody keeps saying there's beds. They don't have anything. They have a cafeteria where you can't go in until after everyone's done eating and you won't get a meal because you have to wait until everyone's done eating. So we talk about displacing people to displace people and we become violent. Respectfully and disrespectfully, everybody sits up on this nice little desk and not a single one of y'all came down to Smithfield Street. It doesn't take much. I don't know if you expect to see crackheads or fights, but that's not what you get. I had my friend down there the other night and she said, I like it here. So imagine what the people that live there think. It is a community, it is an ecosystem of people who support one another. Every community has flaws, but that doesn't mean that that community should be displaced. You wanna move them all across the city, but you're not recognizing that you're breaking up a family. It's simply perpetuating the violence that we keep on saying doesn't exist in our very, very violent and racist city. So if you wanna do something, you can come down to the shelter on Thursday where we'll have soul food at Smithfield Street, where I fundraise by myself for the people because no one else has. If y'all wanna come down there because y'all keep talking about people that y'all not talking to, that would be a blessing. Because you could serve food, you could talk to people, you can learn what the city is lying about because I've proven it all on Twitter. The final thing that I'll say is everyone in this room knows who I am. You know what I'm capable of. This is not a threat. This is a promise. You close those doors without placing the 146, 125, 111 that everybody has a different number for. I promise you I'm not going to be so quiet. I'm not going to be feeding people. I'm going to be disrupting every single day until those people have somewhere to sleep that is safe, that is warm, that is for them. You do what you want with that, but we're not going to stop. And if it's just me and my friends walking down the street in the middle of the day, you will hear us, you will see us, and we won't stop. Peace and blessings. I'll see you all Thursday. Eliana Bagel, followed by LaVon Ritter. Hi. Yeah, Eliana Beagle. You guys did a great job with the name. I know it's tricky. Um, so I'm also here to speak against the closing of Smithfield Shelter. Um, to be honest, uh, closing a homeless shelter feels like the kind of thing you shouldn't need to argue against. Um, especially when so many of our uh, unhoused neighbors already have nowhere to go. There is already a shortage of beds. Um, it's just cruel. It's heartless. We all know that. Um, so what? People will be displaced. They'll end up at an encampment that the county will just tear down anyway. Uh, they'll be downtown. They'll get hassled by police for loitering. They'll end up in the county jail. God forbid an unhoused person make a tourist uncomfortable, right? What are people supposed to do and where are they supposed to go? And 
If the county doesn't have a good answer, is that just because y'all don't care? LaVon Ritter, Sam Schmidt. Good evening, council, everybody in attendance. My name is Sam Schmidt. Um, I had something prepared to speak um, against the closure of the Smithfield Street shelter, but I'm just gonna reiterate things that have already been said here. These are not these are people, and we're not treating them like people. There's already a shortage of beds in the city and county, we know this. Closing this shelter is absolutely unfeasible. I know this as a person who works volunteering at Smithfield and 6th Street every, street, every Sunday at, with a mutual aid group, providing basic necessities and resources for the people that do not have shelter in downtown Pittsburgh. Every week there's a greater need. Closing the shelter is in no way gonna lessen that need. All it's gonna do is take the burden away from government, who we rely on for legislation to protect our most vulnerable, and put that on people like me and the community and the other volunteers who have spoken, and that's gonna be our problem to solve. These people are sleeping outside, not because of defects in their character, but because of failures in capitalism and government, and that's important to recognize. So again, I would just please urge you to reconsider the closing of this shelter. Please, please, we're asking you to do better today. Thank you. Johnny Patterson. <laughs> Stephanie Sorensen. William O'Donnell. Marty Taylor. Mr. President, we have three that signed up after the fact, if you want to allow them to speak. No. Ron L. Guy. Bernadette Mosey. I had something quickly prepared. My name is Bernadette, I'm from Beachview. I kind of see a, in listening today, I see a contrast in comparison. In the 90s and the early 2000s, I would load up the bus that I drove to state and federal prisons as a volunteer, and my kids would, on the holidays, we would go downtown, and my little girl would come out and knock on a cardboard box, hand them a breakfast, and then my mother, who worked at Saks Fifth Avenue, would gift wrap Pierre Cardin and silk boxers. Um, they were well-dressed in the early years. But then jump to two weeks ago, and I've always loaded up my chair with canned goods from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I've, for the first time, somebody who said they worked at Smithfield, there was 12 people there across from Burlington, took the cans one by one, and as I begged her not to, she dropped them into the garbage. As a man on the corner holding up a sign got very upset with her. That's nearer there, but I think society has put this change in attitude on the homeless, and I don't know how we fix that. But um, I would like to read something that I wrote in, 2000, in the year 2000, um, and I think this is appropriate for today. I hope I could read this really fast. Where to go? And oh, how he must cry. In a world of plenty, where children starve and their mothers reap, where children covet and greed will seep. In the world of plenty, where sickness it overflows and health will rot, where businesses prevails and the haves over the haves and the haves nots. In the world of plenty, where babies cry out in garbage pails and alleys, where little ones with bruises and hide from their mommies and daddies in the world of plenty where young teen hearts search out for acceptance where others will use them without a glimmer of repentance in the world of plenty where cardboard boxes serve as home where people blindly stroll by ignoring yet alone in the world of plenty where women hide blackened arms and battered faces where society will blame them and point fingers in all the wrong places in the world of plenty where the Bible sits on shelves and collects worldly dust 
where his word is replaced with sin and rancid lust. In a world of plenty where Christ was sacrificed, bled, and died, where his siblings have forgotten and refused to abide, in the world of plenty where the Holy Spirit is time and again ignored, where the world of plenty is favored and greatly adorned, in the world of plenty where his children give up and won't even try, where Heavenly Father must watch with heartache and pain, oh, how he must cry. Last up, Brian Engler. Good evening, Council. My name's Brian Englert. I'm from West Mifflin. I am a correction officer at the Allegheny County Jail and currently the president of our union. <clears throat> I'm here to support uh, Ordinance 12345-22, raising the wage for county employees as a president of a union, I disagree that this will impact collective bargaining. Right now we're doing contract talks. This is in no way going to impact anything that I'm doing. I also agree with the Labor Council. I don't see how that's an issue. I think it's fair that we pay a better wage to county employees because as we see many of the executives go out with large raises, I sit in a jail that struggles every day to have medical assistance, medical assistance to clear people at the door to be brought into the jail. They make $17.01 an hour, and we can't get anybody at that rate because we're not paying what the hospitals pay. So the solution the county has is to pay a sergeant $61 an hour in overtime to clear the door because we can't pay a medical assistant three or $4 more. I mean, I think it's only fair and it's only right that county employees earn a livable wage. Most people take a county job, not for the pay, but for the benefits. And unfortunately, with the way inflation has gone, the pay has not caught up. The pay hasn't caught up, and I think it's only fair. As a union leader, I support uh, you know, increasing that wage for county employees. Um, I also want to say thank you. Uh, you did pass unanimously um, to change the ordinance to um, lift the uh, residency requirement to live in Allegheny County. Uh, I only hope the county does the right thing and actually advertises in the other counties to get me more employees. Um, we definitely need them. But I want to thank you for that and thank you for your time today. A motion to approve the minutes of the April 18th, 2023 regular meeting of council. So moved. moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. There any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carried. <laughs> Presentation of appointments, 12711-23. Approving the joint appointment of Mark Stephen Bybro to the Independent Police Review Board for a term to expire on June 6, 2027, sponsored by Councilmember Walton. That will go to appointment review. Unfinished business, Committee on Government Reform for the second reading, 12345-22. An ordinance of the County of Allegheny, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, amending and supplementing the Administrative Code of Allegheny County, Article 1009, entitled Personnel Policies, through the creation of a new Section 5-1009.09, entitled Non-Salaried Employee Pay, in order to establish a uniform policy governing the payment of county employees, sponsored by Council Members Hallam, Prizio, Betkowski, and Bennett. Council Member Hallam. Uh, thank you so much, President Katina. This bill was uh, affirmatively re recommended to the full council on uh, June 21st, and then it was it went through many committee processes. We had multiple meetings on government reform, and eventually came forward in front of us all um, as amended on May 23rd of 2023. And I would like to make a motion to approve this bill. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. We'll have discussion at this point in time. Council Member Powell. Thank you so much, President Katina. Uh, so first and foremost, I know this bill has been a long time coming. I want to thank every single one of my colleagues who have participated in the discussions and added to the committee process on this bill, and all of the members from the community who have come out time after time, all of the discussions about this, just to make sure that we had it right and that we did it right the first time. 
ultimately, throughout our process, there have been a lot of questions and requests for data from my colleagues on council, and I believe that as a result, we have a stronger bill that we're talking about today. The basic principle is simple. We want to pay county employees a competitive minimum wage because we need to be fair to our employees in order to attract and retain qualified and motivated individuals. Council Member Doar expressed the desire to spread the fiscal impact of the change over three years rather than doing it in one jump. And we saw wisdom in adopting that proposed amendment, which is the form of the ordinance that you see here tonight. We received one legal opinion expressing concerns about the bill and another indicating that it was within council's purview. Both of these opinions are purely advisory and neither is binding upon us, but all of my colleagues on council have seen those legal opinions and are able to vote today with those in mind. I do want to quickly touch on a couple of points that I believe are important. I've heard some people suggest that they believe that this ordinance is outside of council's, council's powers because it would govern county employees. In my view, that is patently incorrect because our administrative code contains provisions governing the county's personnel system. That's our job. The code provisions in part 10, which are actually called personnel, set standards for things like merit hiring, paid holidays, our career service requirements, residency restrictions, employee orientation and employee handbook requirements, performance evaluations, employee development, employee layoffs, discharges, suspensions, and demotions. All of that under our purview. Our Home Rule Charter requires that the Administrative Code covers these topics because it says the, per the personnel system must be included in the County Code. <laughs> Council adopts that code and amends it through the legislative process. We are legislators. It is our duty to legislate in the best interest of all of the people in Allegheny County, regardless of which district you represent or which party you come from. The Charter says even more than that. Article 4 says that the council has the power and duty to, by ordinance or resolution, modify or eliminate any department, agency, or function that no longer meets the needs of the county's taxpayers. This language is clear and specifically establishes that this council, and not the county executive, has overall authority over the county department's existence and functions. That charter also gives council authority over the county's annual operating budget, which contains the appropriations that pay every single county employee and elected official. Our current administration and some others have suggested that the cost of increasing the amounts that we pay our employees are simply too high. I, for one, cannot subscribe to the notion that the only way we can balance a billion dollar annual operating budget is to have our own employees subsidize that budget by receiving a low wage. I cannot get behind that and I will never get behind that. The Commonwealth and the federal government have minimum wage statutes. These statutory minimum wages have not been adjusted in years, even as the cost of literally everything is going up around us. Employers are free to decide their own minimum pay rate for themselves, so as long as it is at least the minimum amount specified in these statutes. And employers throughout the Commonwealth and the entire country routinely do so in order to be fair to the employees upon who they depend. Allegheny County is not free from this exact same obligation. We have an obligation to pay our workers. We have a county, an obligation to provide the best county government that we can possibly provide. And the only way to do that is to vote yes on this bill tonight, and I cannot wait to do that. I hope every single one of you sitting up with me here tonight are going to do that as well. Let's raise the wage. Thank you, President Katina. Thank you. Anyone next? Councilman DeMarco? Thank you, Mr. President. I would just like to say, uh, speaking to the taxpayers of Allegheny County, the people who we bill to take and submit taxes to the county to run our government, that this bill, as we've been told by the administration, the county executive's office would require a tax increase in the amount of $30 million plus dollars, okay? Um, we are in a precarious financial situation. We were fortunate to pass the budget last December, you know, utilizing money that we had from ARP and things like that. So we were able to say for the last 21 of the last 22 years, we did not raise property taxes. 
But as many of you also know, we're currently in discussions with the uh, subcommittee on property reassessment, special committee on reassessments. We've extended the appeal period there because the CLR was viewed as too high. So there are thousands, thousands of appeals out there for folks waiting to come before us to have their property assessed values lowered, which will result in lower tax revenue to us. In addition, downtown here in the commercial space, we're running with an occupancy or vacancy rate of 23.4%. Many of these businesses have not recovered you know, from the pandemic, and we are going to take and see a number of them coming to us, appealing the property value on their buildings. Uh, those are going to result in lower tax revenues into us. We have a senior population, many of which are living on a fixed income. And, you know, raising their taxes is going to put a strain on those folks. At this point in time, I can't support this bill because I don't believe, A, it's within our purview, B, it complies with Pennsylvania law, and C, that it's good financial sense. We heard some of our previous speakers talk about people don't come to work for the county to work for the county for the wages, they come for the benefits. So let's let the public know what some of those benefits are. Um, county employees only pay 3.2% of their wages for health care. I know folks in the private sector would love to leap at that. County employees who are full-time employees can collect a pension. That's been gone in the private sector for many, many years. These are all things that the county has to keep up and has to maintain. I've been told in the labor negotiations with many of the collective bargaining agreements with many of the unions that have come before us, their main concern wasn't in raising the wages per se, but was in keeping the costs low for their members, health insurance and things like that for their family. So the, the compensation uh, you know, covers a lot of different things. It's not just in the wages. You know, and I would point out that uh, you know, some members of council were quoted in the newspaper having, having talked about these department heads that came before us and told them that we needed to raise these rates in order for them to fill those positions. And I can tell you, sitting on the Committee for Government Reform, we didn't hear from a single department head in, in a single meeting discussing that there. And I think we've just taken and announced, or the polls have opened for our wave polls, we've been able to take and fill. Matter of fact, we've taken and hired more than the total staff for lifeguards and things like that, not paying any of them $20 an hour. So look, I think, you know, we have a delicate balance here. We obviously want our employees to be able to make as much money as they can. I want anybody to be able to make as much money as they can. You know, and I encourage them to develop the skill sets that allow them to obtain employment or jobs that will provide that. But we can't just wave a wand and say, hey, we're going to give you this when we have to take it away from someone else. And that's what separates us from the private sector, and that's why I can't support this bill tonight. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, members of council. So I, I spoke about this bill a number of times during the committee process, and as Councilwoman Hallam said, we had you know, a number of robust discussions both in committee, both outside of committee uh, on this bill, its validity, the issues surrounding it, uh, the legal questions surrounding it, as well as its cost. Um, I want to speak to speak tonight as someone who this bill would directly affect, should I, should I have been an employee of the county. Um, you know, $20 an hour, which this bill would get to in three years over a period of time, and I want to thank the committee for adopting that resolution uh, and th that amendment, I think, given the financial uncertainties the county the county is under, I think it was a very you know fiscally prudent thing for us to do. Um, uh, you know, but twenty dollars an hour uh, gets you to around forty thousand dollars your salary. Um, I've only made that once in my life since graduating college. Um, I work in an industry that is overworked and underpaid, and I work my ass off. Uh, uh, I have to get my own health care costs. I'm often 1099 um, and, you know, I've made additional number of sacrifices to be serving on this body while continuing to serve in that industry. And for those of you who are running what that industry is, it's politics. I work on campaigns for a living. Um, uh, you know, I I've seen firsthand in this industry 
what happens when you underwork, uh, when you overwork and underpay employees. People leave. Um, we've hemorrhaged talent in this region from that industry because we have done just that. And it's not just been here, it's been nationally in this industry because we consistently do not pay our employees the wages they deserve. We overwork them. Uh, and this is all while you know, fighting for living wages from the Democratic Party who are the ones supposed to be championing these policies. Um, so I've, I've lived this. I've lived working under this, this living wage um, since I've graduated college. It's difficult. It requires a lot of sacrifice. And it hasn't been for a lack of effort. It hasn't been for a lack of you know, opportunities. It's just been we live, you know, I work in a system and we live in a system that doesn't set an adequate floor for these positions, for these positions as a whole. So, you know, this is a bill that is very personal to me. Uh, and I think during the committee process, I think Councilman Bennett, you were, you know, as a discussion, is the only other one who had lived at these wages, um, uh, who would this, if you would have been working at the county, would this have directly affected? Um, you know, uh, it, this is the right thing to do. Uh, living wage, given increased inflation, given everything that's going on, you know, has the, opportunity to bring people out of poverty, to make someone's life more stable. Um, and once again, uh, someone who's lived this directly um, uh, would have been, would be a huge boon to someone like me should I have been one of, be, be one of these employees who this would affect in uh, working in county government. So um, uh, once again, appreciate uh, my colleagues' robust discussion on this. I respect mm -hmm. Um, both the administration and my colleagues' uh, opinions who might not support this bill tonight. We've had a ton of discussions around that. Um, but, uh, you know, looking forward to this moving forward, uh, following some hopefully more robust discussions. And I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilman On the line. <laughs> well, we'll start from the beginning. Um, the ordinance could come out during a committee meeting, and I had put an amendment in to take it from $20 to $18 an hour for the full-time employees and $15 for part-time. High school kids, college kids, cutting grass, uh, lifeguards. I didn't think it would be a good idea to pay them the exact amount of somebody that has skill sets in our county, even a college education. Um, it might create some animosity, uh, compression, as we call it, during our county and create major problems, even possible lawsuits. Um, my amendment failed in the, the committee process, and then Tom Doerr introduced the $18 an hour for everyone, 19 the second year, and 20 the third year. I was not exactly in favor of that because um, we legislate up here. Um, if we started at $18, which I had proposed, Next year, we have that opportunity to come back and look at it again. But with this legislation, we don't. It's already set in stone. It's 18, 19, 20, no matter what happens as far as the assessments, as far as what happens with the new administration, we just don't know. It's an unknown. So for us to come back every year and evaluate and reconsider an increase in the salaries, that's okay. But you can't take something away once you give it you can't say, well, you know, we made a mistake last year. Maybe we can't give you that $19 this year, but we're putting in our net position in this council that that's exactly what's happening. Um, I'm a businessman. I pay my, my employees very well, and I don't tell my employees I'm gonna pay you every year an increase. I wait each year to talk to them and say, yes, I'm gonna give you a raise because I have compensated my business so that you can get more money. I think the same thing falls here. Uh, as a business owner, I think we should all consider ourselves business owners here at council and decide I would support an $18 an hour minimum wage for one year. And then let's discuss what we can do next year because there's going to be some members of this council that may not be here next year and they're not going to have to deal with what we're doing today. And that's an issue. We got a new administration. We don't know what's going to happen. So why would we go three years out? when I don't feel it's necessary. So I'm not gonna vote for this. Not that I'm against paying people a decent wage. I am, because I do it myself, I practice it. 
but I just don't think we should go out three years, 18, 19, and 20, because we just don't know what the future is. I believe we have that opportunity to come back next year's budget, not this year's, and, and discuss it again. So that's the way I feel, thank you. Councilwoman Bennett. What? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as Councilman Brodeur uh, stated, I am the, uh, the only other person on council who has had a, uh, who has lived under the living wage or under a minimum or, or livable wage. I um, think for the last two years, and I just started making a livable wage last year. And, uh, I, and as a black woman, that is not uncommon for black women in this area. I would like to remind everyone that we had a gender equity report that said that. And many of the people that work for our county are black women who who had single women, black, uh, single parent households. And so I just would like to remind council that if we're really gonna be what we say we're gonna be and we want people to have a, a fair shot and a, live, a shot at living, uh, being able to live in this county um, and not put that burden and continue putting that burden on the backs of black women, then we should be voting in favor of this. Um, and to Councilman Fatulis's Point. This ordinance goes into effect if approved in 2024. So three years from 2024 is 2027. Forty thousand dollars in 2027 is not going to be a livable wage at that point either. So, um, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, <coughs> Councilman Klein. <coughs> thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, I have to tell you, I can't recall a time when. Um, I ever heard uh, those who resisted in some way such a proposal saying that this is a good time to increase wages, uh, particularly when the people on the receiving end of this were public employees, as if there is this expectation that when you serve the public, you at the same time decide to take a vow of poverty. So um, I, I'm just remembering that in, in 2001, there was a book that immediately went to the top of the bestseller list. And it was written by a woman by the name of Barbara Ehrenrich, and it was called Nickled and Dimed. And uh, in her book, what she was doing was she, she profiled the lives of people uh, who were living and working in this country, who were playing by the rules, who honored by their labor the work ethic that we proclaim and still, they were not able to make ends meet. Many held full-time jobs, but it was not enough. And even with an additional part-time job, they struggled against what she referred to simply as destitution. And yet many, if we take a look at the metrics, looked at them back then and today, were considered to be middle class. Barbara Ehrenrich saw it in this way. She said, these people are not middle class. That classification is misleading and uninformed. She said, these people are what we might more honestly call the working poor. The adjustment that is being proposed here is really a modest one. It will not change the trajectory of the lives of those county employees who serve all of us and who do work that does seem to matter to all of us. But it is an acknowledgement, it is an acknowledgement that pay equity does matter. And so with this effort, we are in some measure making a start to making some important adjustment. So thank you, Mr. President. Councilman, or Councilwoman Nakai Kafka. Thank you, President Katina. Um, I just wanted to remind my colleagues that the Economic Policy Institute has indicated that the effective minimum wage has increased in 30 states and DC since 2014. Pennsylvania is not one of those 30 states. Within those 30 states, 47 localities, so we're talking about the local level, such as our county government, have adopted minimum wages above those state minimum wages. Pittsburgh, falls in the top 12 of cities with the lowest real minimum wage. In February of 2022, Target set minimum wages ranging from $15 an hour to $24 an hour. 
So that gets to this discussion that we heard from many people this evening who were providing public comment that the county has to be competitive in the marketplace. I believe that we're early enough in this year, this calendar year, that should this pass, that gives us sufficient time then to incorporate this into the county budget planning process to ensure that we have sufficient funding to carry out operations of all the departments within county government. Um, and just as a side note, I did learn this week that we do have lifeguards um, that are being paid 18 to $20 an hour for the head lifeguard position. So just wanted to make note of that. Thank you. Councilman motion. Councilman DeMarker. I, I would just like for the record to say that I believe everybody up here probably started out with some type of minimum wage. So while Compliment Doer or Compliment Bennett may have been may have been the most recent, okay? I remember working for a dollar seventy an hour, all right? So we didn't just wake up and make six figures or something like that. You know, we started somewhere, we developed skills, we moved on from there. And eighteen dollars an hour isn't twenty. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And certainly last but not least, what I want to say. Uh, <laughs> Council authority, we've heard it tonight that council doesn't obviously have the authority to do this. I'm gonna make this real simple. Per our charter, the administrative code governs our employees. Quite simply, council enacts that code. Therefore, we have the ability to do so, period. Interference with bargaining. Some people have said that this ordinance interferes with the ability of unions to collectively bargain. If that's correct, every federal and state minimum wage statute should be invalidated immediately and struck down tonight. Because those function the same way that this ordinance in fact does. Former Governor Wolf's order mandating increased minimum wage for Commonwealth employees would legally be impermissible. Furthermore, any private employer that opts to establish a floor for its employees' pay rates would also be infringing on the collective bargaining. It's clearly not the case. Now, why shouldn't we pay lower rung employees this much? I mean, I've heard that argument as well tonight. So let's just talk about this a little bit. So I was thinking about Sheets Convenience Stores and what Sheets Convenience Stores plays its employees. As of yesterday, a regular team member, jobs are posted between 14 and 16.50 per hour at various area locations with an extra buck 50 per hour worked overnight at each location and at least one location offering a $500 sign-on bonus. About a week ago, I was informed by the administration there are roughly 1,400 county jobs currently unfilled. If we're only barely competitive with convenience stores in terms of pay, we're not giving people, particularly seasonal and temporary employees, any real reason to want to fill any of those vacancies. Furthermore, I've heard about a tax increase. Allegheny County's enacted 2023 operating budget totals just under $1 billion, just under $1.02 billion, to be specific. <sighs> if we can't figure out a way to balance a budget of that size with our existing revenues without forcing hundreds of our county employees to, to subsidize it by working for less pay than they could make elsewhere, then our budgeting skills have a lot to be desired. Finally, interference with contracting power. I've heard a lot about contracting power tonight. Some people have said that this ordinance is impermissible because it interferes with the executive's contracting power. It is true that our home rule charter does say the executive is empowered to negotiate, award, and sign, or cause to be awarded and signed on behalf of the county, all contracts, agreements, and other instruments, except as provided in Article 6, Section 2, Subsection, blah, blah, blah. But nothing contained in the charter says that the executive is, in fact, above the law of the county in that process. And the law is replete with examples of restrictions on the executive's contracting power. Just to name a few, Article 913 governs public work contracts. Article 911 con governs contracts generally and places specific requirements on language. Article 909 establishes procedures for entering and modifying revenue products. In 2007, Ordinance 08 07 0R was passed. This bill co-sponsored by then Council President Fitzgerald 
amended the purchasing code to prohibit the county from contracting to buy goods that were made under sweatshop conditions. Just before the final vote on that ordinance, Council President Fitzgerald noted, I think this is an excellent piece of legislation. Article 705 of the Administrative Code, governing naming rights and enacted by an ordinance and also co-sponsored by then President Fitzgerald, restricts the chief executive's ability to freely contract in that setting. Many of these provisions were enacted as part of the first county administrative code in 2000, and they are all, uh, all are the law of the county right now. The executive's contract power clearly is not absolute. It's never been absolute. It's been restricted by our administrative code from the very first year of our home rule charter in Allegheny County. Our current chief executive has also both sponsored and presided over the enactment of legislation that restricts the executive's contracting power. Ordinance 07-10-0R was co-sponsored by Council President Fitzgerald and imposes restrictions on service contracts relating to county-owned projects. As former President Fitzgerald noted at the time of the bill was passed, restricting the executive's contracting authority was central to the intent of that ordinance. Quote, I just wanted to get on the record that the legislative intent of this bill deals directly with the direct contracts that this county has in some of our buildings. Bill number 0126 was introduced in 2001. The bill was broader in scope than 07-10-0R and it required both an increased minimum wage for all full-time county employees and a living wage for employees working for entities having contracts with the county. Then Council Member Fitzgerald was a sponsor of this bill as well, and during that meeting, at which the bill was voted upon, he called the increased minimum wage for county employees one of the highlights of this bill. Although 0126 did not pass, an increased minimum wage for all county employees was in fact front and center of that very bill, and requirements governing pay rates for parties entering contacts with the county were also very much included. Now, Chief Executive Fitzgerald had indicated he's going to veto this ordinance that establishes a minimum wage for county employees, just as he himself proposed in 2001. Clearly, the shoe is now on the other foot. Uh, this decision ostensibly is based on spacious arguments that council does not have this authority and that this minimum wage hinders collective bargaining. It is my sincerest hope tonight that the chief executive sincerely remembers the day he sat in this very chair and supported living wages and realizes the importance of paying our own employees competitive and fair wages. Chief Executive, please remember sitting in this very chair tonight. Thank you very much. We'll now take the vote, Jared. On the motion to approve, Ms. Bennett. Yes. Mr. Betkowski. Yes. Mr. DeMarco. No. Mr. Dewar. Yes. Mr. Fatoulis. No. Ms. Hallam. Yes. Mr. Klein. Yes. Mr. Macy. No. Ms. Nacaretti Chapkis. Yes. Mr. Palmieri. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mr. Palmasena. Yes. Ms. Prizio. Yes. Mr. Walton. I think the legislation is basically um, as the bill has voted yes. President Katina. Yes. Ayes 10, nose 4, with one member absent. The bill passes. We'll now have liaison reports. Councilman Dewar. Uh, President Katina, just wanted to let the members of council know that the Board of Elections met yesterday to certify the results of the 2023 primary election. There was no hiccups in that. Uh, all of the uh, certified results, the official results, are now on the county's website, as are the official results of all of the write-in races as well. So if anyone has any, uh, is it, you know, curious about those final results, um, please go check. Uh, and preparations are already underway for the 2023 general election. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bennett. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to take a moment to shout out the new leadership Pennsylvania held at Chatham University. I got to uh, be a 
member of a panel yesterday. It's a group of young ladies, about 25 young ladies from across the state from different universities um, learning leadership and specifically about politics. So under the direction of Dr. Dana Brown. So just wanted to give them a shout out and uh, hopefully I get to visit back again next year. Thank you. Councilman Paul Mary. Thank you, Mr. President, members of council. I had a busy couple of weeks here. Uh, the other day, we finished up uh, the year with CCAC uh, in our um, year ending uh, meeting uh, for the summer. And I just want to report to everybody that CCAC is in really decent shape and we will con continue to serve this community to the best of our ability. And I also wanted to point out to you that out of the 15 colleges in Pennsylvania, we're the lowest when it comes to charging the children and the people what it costs to go to school. We're the biggest bargain in a family budget. There's no doubt about it. And anyone that has any aspirations, any young people have any aspirations about furthering their education, please, please come to CCAC, talk to a counselor, talk to people over there, and I assure you, you will be treated fairly, justly, and more, more than anything else, you'll be able to afford us. Also, Mr. President, I wanted to mention on Memorial Day, I was over Castle Shannon for their ceremonies. It was a beautiful day, it was a, a beautiful ceremony. I was proud to be there. I also was at Clareton for their VFW at their, uh, what was the other one? American, <laughs> American Legion. American Legion. I got, I got, a, I can't, for some reason, I just got, I go blank there. But I was there both with uh, the veterans over there. And you know, the interesting thing about Memorial Day, we honor the people who gave their lives the last full measure. Not the veterans that are alive today, but there were so many people there, it was unbelievable. And Clareton, of all places, had a wonderful luncheon for everybody that was there. It was just marvelous to be able to, to be among the veterans, to be among the people who came over, and they remember what Memorial Day is all about. Yeah, I could have done a lot of other things, but you know what? I was there because I wanted to be there, and I was proud to be there. So please, whatever you do, Veterans Day, the real Veterans Day is November 11th. That's for the live, the live veterans. That's when you go up and thank them for their service. Pretty hard to thank those people on, on Memorial Day. They're, <laughs> I wish we could thank them. We do, we honor them. We don't, we don't, you can't thank them, but we honor them. So I just wanted to share with you, Mr. President and, and Council, that the, the fact that um, citizenship is still alive and well in Allegheny County. Thank you. Councilwoman Pritka. Yes, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, the third annual Pride Millvale will be on June 24th. Uh, co County Council is going to have a booth there, a table, and it's from noon to eight o'clock. So if people can sign up for a shift, that'd be great as my council member Hallam has the, the flyer up there. So I hope to see everyone there. Thank you. Thank you. We'll not move on. Oh, um, I just want to remind everybody the jail oversight board meeting is this Thursday at 4 p.m. in this room right here. I know it's usually the first Thursday of the month, but they moved it again. So in this room this Thursday, 4 p.m., be here. Okay, new business ordinances resolutions 12709-23. An ordinance of the County of Allegheny, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, amending Allegheny County Code of Ordinances, Chapter 220, entitled Campaign Finance Reports and Statements in order to establish requirements and prohibitions relating to the county's searchable public database of campaign finance reports and certain forms of coordinated campaign expenditures and clarifying existing law relating to penalties for violations sponsored by Councilmember Dewar. That will go to Government Reform 12710-23. An ordinance of the County of Allegheny, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 
Pennsylvania, amending the Allegheny County Code of Ordinances through the establishment of a new Chapter 300 entitled Housing in order to establish uniform procedures governing the closure or reduction in size of homeless shelters funded by Allegheny County, sponsored by Councilmember Hallam. That will go to Economic Development and Housing, 12712-23. An ordinance of the County of Allegheny, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, authorizing the Jurassic Alcove Incorporated to have exclusive use of a structure known as Exhibit Building Number 8 on Brownsville Road in the County South Park, sponsored by the Chief Executive. That will go to Parks, 12713-23. An ordinance authorizing the County of Allegheny in conjunction with the Department of Public Works and the Law Department to rename the Squaws Run Bridges numbers one through eight located within Fox Chapel Borough and O'Hara Township, Allegheny County, sponsored by the Chief Executive. That will go to Public Works, 12714-23. An ordinance of the County of Allegheny, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, authorizing the extinguishment of an existing easement and the grant of a new easement to the Monroeville Municipal Authority to place additional water treatment structures and utility lines within a portion <laughs> of the county's Boyce Park, sponsored by the Chief Executive. That will go to Public Works, 12715-23. An ordinance of the Council of the County of Allegheny, ratifying amendments to the Allegheny County Health Department's Rules and Regulations, Article 2, entitled Needle Exchange Program, sponsored by the Chief Executive. That will go to Health and Human Services, 12716-23. An ordinance of the Council of the County of Allegheny ratifying an amendment that revises Section 2105.73, Municipal Solid Waste Landfills of the Allegheny County Health Department Rules and Regulations, Article 21, Air Pollution Control, sponsored by the Chief Executive. That will go to Health and Human Services as well, 12717-23. An ordinance to the Council of the County of Allegheny ratifying amendments to the Allegheny County Health Department's Rules and Regulations, Article 23, entitled Universal Blood Lead Level Testing, sponsored by the Chief Executive. That will go to Health and Human Services as well. New business motions, 12718. Mr. President. Two. Hold on, We're, we'll do that at the very end, after we get through the two of them. Okay. We'll do your motion. Okay. Um, one two seven one eight dash two three. Motion of the Council of Allegheny County approving the Allegheny League of Municipalities contract with the Allegheny Council Co County Council Human Resources Personnel Management and Administration Project, sponsored by Councilmember Paul Mary. That will go to the Executive Committee one two seven one nine dash two three. A motion of the Council of Allegheny County authorizing a public hearing pursuant to Section 801.05 of the Administrative Code on Thursday, June 15, 2023, at 6 o'clock p.m. in the Gold Room of the Allegheny County Courthouse, sponsored by Councilmember Hallam. Councilmember Hallam, I believe you'd like to make this motion. I would, President Cantina, um, I would like to make a motion to approve a public hearing in this room at 6 p.m. next Thursday, June 15th, uh, to discuss the proposed Smithfield shelter closure. Second. And I, I'd like to ask for a second. Thank you. Motion has been made and second. Is there any discussion? Go ahead. Anyone have any discussion? Yeah. Do you think it might be a little too soon, just next week? <laughs> So the, the date that the county has actually put out there that they plan to close it is that day, and so there is kind of a timeline okay. on when this needs to be done. Okay. I Thank didn't mean to like step over and answer, no, but um, I just want to say, you know, I know everyone has been hearing about the Smithfield shelter. I know we had a lot of people come and talk about it here tonight. And the reality is we have as many questions as you all do. We were not included in any discussions about the plan to close this shelter. We were not given any heads up that this was about to be announced. We were not included in that decision. So I'm sure that a lot of us up here are actually feeling a lot of the same frustrations as you are and we want answers. And so we want the folks who are being impacted by Smithfield closing to come here and talk to us. We want the county to tell us what happened. Why did we announce that Smithfield was going to remain open indefinitely and then suddenly propose an arbitrary timeline to shut it down? Where are the people who are in Smithfield currently going to go? This isn't really even a shelter. It's an overnight accommodation for people so they don't have to sleep on the streets. So for anyone who is upset about people sleeping on the streets, you should want to know what they're going to do to help the people who are currently using the shelter. Um, it's estimated based off of numbers that have been collected that around 600 unique individuals utilize this place's services every single month. Where are they going to go? If the county has a plan, where are those facilities? How many beds are available at those facilities? Are they truly low barrier like Smithfield has been? We don't have any answers. We want them. I hope that all of my colleagues, regardless of how you feel about that, will keep an open mind, be open to the idea of having a public hearing where we can all come together, ask our questions, not make decisions, but listen and find out what we need to know. So 
that's how I feel I'll be voting in favor of this public hearing. I hope that you will not only vote for it right now, but that you will actually commit to show up and participate in it and hear from the residents of the shelter and hear from the constituents that have thoughts about it as well. I have a written down. Any other discussion? Harry, no other discussion. Jared, take a roll call vote. On the motion to approve, Ms. Bennett. Yes. Mr. Bekowski. Yes. Mr. DeMarco. Yes. Mr. Dewar. Yes. Mr. Fatoulis. Yes. Ms. Hallam. Yes. Mr. Klein. Yes. Mr. Macy. Yes. Ms. Nacaretti Chapkis. Yes. Mr. Palmieri. Yes. Mr. Palmasena. Yes. Ms. Prizio. Yes. Mr. Walton. Okay. <laughs> I'll interpret that as a yes. <laughs> President Katina. Yes. Ayes 14, no zero with one member absent. The bill passes. Thank you. I believe Councilwoman Bennett has a motion to amend the agenda. Councilwoman Bennett. Thank you, Mr. President. And yes, I do have a uh, amendment to, uh, motion and a, <laughs> sorry, tongue tied. I would like to amend the agenda, include a motion to, uh, uh, to publicly seek out folks to fill the committee or the study group on the reimagining juvenile justice. Um, so uh, can we amend, I would like to make the motion to amend the agenda for that advertisement. Is there a second? I'll second. Does it, do we need a roll call vote on this one or? Could she explain it a little bit better? This is just the, this is just just the amend the agenda. Yeah. Oh, I get it. So to amend the agenda, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries. Now go ahead with the actual motion. Okay, now I would like to introduce the motion to uh, to do a public advertisement to fill the study group for the reimagining ju juvenile justice in Allegheny County. Thank you. I would like to make that motion. I'd like to second that motion. Oh, motion has been made and seconded. It's being passed out as we speak. I'll give everyone a second to read it. As you're reading it, can I just remind yeah, folks? Okay. So this, uh, as y'all remember, may, may or may not remember, in March we uh, we approved a motion to develop a study group to talk around uh, the closing of Schumann and what a reopening of a juvenile uh, facility would look like. Um, and we voted to do a study group. So at this time, we are now advertising to fill that study group. Um, publicly so that we can get public interest on uh, seating that, that that study group and that is what this motion is for this evening is just to put the advertisement out to get the folks for the study group. Motion has been made and second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, <clears throat> motion carries. Councilman Macy, I believe you also have a motion to amend the agenda. Thank you. Uh, President Katina, uh, a little over 60 days ago, uh, I introduced an ordinance, uh, Bill Number 12638-23, and uh, I believe it uh, was sent to a government reform. But if you know, over the last several months, there was a lot of things going on, the elections, and people were pretty busy. So I'm not blaming anybody for us not making it uh, to government reform. However, I'm sorry. Man. So I'd like to uh, pull this bill out of, um, out of committee and, uh, and I, it, Jared, if you'd like to uh, please read the preamble to the ordinance, to the resolution, ordinance, I mean. Wait, we need to make the motion to amend still. So you're making that motion. Is there a second to amend? Well, do you think people should know what, what it is? Can't talk about it. We're, we're just amending the agenda. We're not, we're just adding it to the agenda. We're not Okay, thank you, doctor. Anymore. I'll second it. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Motion carries. Go ahead, Councilman. You can continue. Jared, uh, could you read that uh, preamble to the ordinance? Okay, the, the item that's been added at this point is the motion to pull, which Sarah, I Sarah's believe, is going to hand out right now. Be ridiculous. 
I'll explain. You okay with that? Go ahead. Okay. You can talk. What, what this ordinance is, does is it takes our stipend and it uh, changes it to a salary. There's no increase in what the charter has provided for us. The only difference is instead of our stipend being predicated on attending council meetings, that our salary will be predicated on the work that we do. And most of we come here for an hour, maybe hour and a half, and most of the work that we do are in our co communities. So, and rather than have a change in some of our paydays, it would be consistent with the pays across the Allegheny County, County's employees. So in other words, we'd get paid two weeks, every two weeks, and that will be in line with other employees and will be throughout the year. Now, historically, we would only get our money up until November, and then for two months, we got nothing. So we're not raising salaries, we're not raising the, um, the amount of money, all we're doing is putting it on the, uh, the uh, payroll schedule like everybody else. And it would be also, up, and I checked with the controller's office, and they said it would be convenient to do that. Thank you. So I make a motion to approve this ordinance. Is there a second? Second. No. Wait, Jared. What? No. We're still on the, I'm adding to, to the agenda. Motion to pull from committee. I thought we did that. No. I thought we said yes. No, it, it, we changed the agenda, it's now to pull. Bingo. So we need a motion to pull. Make a motion to pull. Is there a second? Second. Okay. second. Motion has been made. Second. Jared, take a roll call vote. On the motion to pull from committee, Ms. Bennett. No. Mr. Bekowski. No. Mr. DeMarco. Yes. Mr. Dewar. Yep. Mr. Fatulis. Sure, yeah. Ms. Hallam. No. Mr. Klein. Yes. Mr. Macy. Yes. Ms. Nacaretti Chapkis. Yes. Mr. Palmieri. Yes. Mr. Palmasina. Yes. Ms. Prizio. Yes. Mr. Walton. Yeah, okay. Uh, President Katina. Yes. So in two Ayes yeah. 11, no's three with one member absent. The motion passes. Okay, now would you like to make the motion to approve the ordinance? Yes, Mr. President, I would. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Mr. President, also I want to just clarify a couple of things too. And uh, Mr. Macy, uh, Council Member Macy, you can clarify this. This would be put on as a ballot referendum, yes? This would need to be a charter change? Absolutely. It okay. would be up to the voters. All right. And the second thing I wanted to talk to you about in terms of clarification was you mentioned that you came up with this in regards to a study that was done in terms of some good governance things that could be adopted that, in terms of changes. I wasn't sure if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, every 10 years, just like um, our, uh, our census, we have a commission on Allegheny County Council, and this was one of their recommendations. So I thought that this would be appropriate, and I had talked to other of my colleagues, and they agreed. Thank you. Council, council, I don't know. Councilwoman. Yeah, so I do not agree. Uh, I think that support for this bill says that we're cool with council members getting lazy, right? We have two meetings a month, and we make almost $11,000 a year. I know it's not a lot for how big the county is, but you make $11,000 a year to go to two meetings a month. This makes it that you can go to no meetings all year and still get $11,000 in taxpayer dollars. You can do even less than what a lot of people on this body do now, because you don't even have to show up to the one regular meeting of council that we have every two weeks weeks. I will not be voting for this. I do not think we should make it easier for elected officials to be lazy. I do not think that we should encourage people to do less work. If you choose to do work in your community, that's what you're supposed to be doing. That's what you were elected to, to do in addition to showing up to a council meeting and voting on bills. I will never support something that says that elected officials do not have to do their job and they'll still be paid. I know we have a lot of those in the county already. We don't need to enable anymore. Thank you. Anyone else that's 
Councilman Bukowski? Yeah, I, I think I have probably, you know, many just uh, unknowns about, um, about this, which is why I think a, a robust discussion in committee uh, would be beneficial f for me if, if even though um, if my colleagues uh, feel that they're sufficiently educated on the issue, that they don't need any further discussion or uh, any referrals from legal or any questions answered by legal, I, I applaud them for their um, wisdom and certainly knowledge much greater than mine. But one of the, the main things that I have with this is this is now the second time we're asking for a referendum in the mere two years, well, less than year and a half that I've been on council. And I agree with my colleague, Councilman Macy, that the charter after 20 some years needs some tweaking. Um, and I won't go into it at this meeting, but clearly there are some things in the charter that are just kind of head scratchers to me. But rather than proceed every single year for maybe the next decade with a drip, 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 one referendum after another referendum after another referendum, my preference would be for this body to have an adult conversation about the charter to lay out those things that have been identified by the previous study group. And then of course solicit current and past members of council, we had some with us here tonight, for their input as to suggestions that they might feel would be beneficial to the charter. And that we can take a more holistic approach rather than this one at another and another kind of methodology. Mr. Ka Mr. President. Uh, look, <clears throat> um, I have some, I have a number of concerns. One, as I shared with my colleague uh, Macy, that I really don't care one way or another about this whole compensation issue because um, the money that I receive for being on council, I really don't care about. They buy cigars for me. You know, uh, you know, it's it's play money, uh, and and but the most important thing is I care about the um, the comments that were uh, that were proffered by uh, Mr. Bedkowski. You know, um, the Home Rule Charter, much like our Constitution, should be viewed as a living document, and and addressed in that manner to um, meet the needs of the residents as we continue to evolve as a society. But the real tragedy of all of this is that this has been sitting in committee for a significant amount of time, and Mr. Macy has attempted to get it moved forward, and because of um, our, the chairman of the Government Reform Committee's shenanigans uh, sat on it and refused to hear it. And so look, um, if we're going to operate in a, in a responsible and an accountable manner, we need to do that across the board. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. President. Go. It's Councilman Futola, sir. Gee, thanks. Um, <laughs> I think I have a legal question at this point. Um, do we really need to change the home rule charter for a particular member that wants to stretch his payout the entire year versus, well, yeah, I mean, it, I, I know what we take home, but if, we, if a particular council member didn't want to take his whole pay, does he have to? And if he wants to stretch it out into a two week period every, every during the year, why can't he do it as an individual? Why do we have to go to a home rule charter to to do something like that, we, that's a question. I I, I don't. The, the, the I, current provision provides that county council members shall not exceed a salary, but may receive per meeting stipend, not to exceed in the aggregate nine thousand annually per member. The aggregate the aggregate stipend may be by ordinance be increased by up to five percent every five years. If you're if the council wants alter that, then you would have to do what is proposed in some manner here by a change to the charter. So you're saying that you cannot 
if I don't want to accept my full pay and stretch it out, I can't? Well, is that what a, you're saying? That's another issue. You can always, well, that's the issue I'm bringing up. I always, know what the Home Rule Charter says, you can always, but the bottom yeah, line is... You can always turn your salary in. If, you if I decide to take $200 less per meeting, why can't I? You can't. Huh? Give it back. Give it back. Well, that's my point. If somebody wants to stretch it out, the 12... I mean, I live in the Eiffel Tower. What was the Ivory Tower, I believe? Yeah, it. yeah so I don't need my pay, okay? Oh, but the bottom... <laughs> 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 but what I'm getting at is there are some members of this council that do depend on their pay and they'd like to get it stretched out. And I see Bob's point about, about taking it every two weeks, but the point is, I, the big question is, do we really need to go to a referendum question to ask how we should take our pay? Now, if you don't show up, I get it. You don't get paid. And, and, and I don't want to be mean or nothing, but you know, you're the biggest offender of not coming to meetings. I've never missed one. Okay, <laughs> but I don't even want to get into that part, but the, but the bottom line is, what I'm trying to say is, do we really need to go to the referendum question for someone to extend their pay if they or have earned it? To, so, that's the question I'm trying to raise. That's not what's before here. The Chairman. question is, are you going to amend Section 7A instead of having the provision for the stipends to provide for an annual salary? And if you think that that's an appropriate thing to be put to the voters, and I'm not commenting one way or another on it, then we would have to amend the charter. Council Member Macy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. And I appreciate everybody's comments. But if we go back and look at the, this, we had a, a blue ribbon commission, highly educated, well-respected in the community, come up with these recommendations. All I've been trying to do is go with their recommendations, and that panel comes together every 10 years. Okay, as far as um, the uh, salary is concerned versus a, uh, a stipend, I don't think anybody here misses more than three meetings. But I do have a concern about getting, not just me, but we as a body getting paid in the same manner as all of the other employees in Allegheny County. So that's why I brought this forward. Now as far as taking all of the recommendations from the commission and lumping it in a referendum vote, it's hard to get people to understand one question in a referendum vote. If we took all of the recommendations from the blue ribbon panel, so to speak, and put them on there, it would just confuse the voters. So if we piecemeal this and we do those things that are recommended, that, like we said, we've been here over 20 years, things do change. And when this was first put together, the charter, it was the state representatives that created the charter and put together all these different uh, restrictions and proposals and things of that nature. So maybe it's our turn to change what they proposed because they had, and it's a supposition, an ulterior motive to keep us under the gun. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, members of council, council member for Tullis, uh, merci. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I have a couple things here, uh, just some, some of my colleagues. So first off, you know, for some reason I kind of, during the past couple, you know, year or so, certainly, but, you know, I've kind of fallen into the, the government reform section of council. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I was such a big proponent of uh, getting rid of resign to run was uniformity across county offices and county council. Um, during my discussions with Council Member Macy, that is his intent here, is uniformity across how members, elected members of this government are paid. I do not see this as a significant change, but it is one that was recommended by this commission, is one that my colleague has pushed pretty adamantly for during my, you know, since this bill has been introduced and in conversations with him, uh, you know, so I, I don't see it as a harm um, and I see it as a continuation of that uh, discussion and effort to try and 
have some uniformity across this county government from what I saw as certainly an oversight when this government was crafted of setting the row offices and county council as, you know, uh, county council is a much lesser entity. Not necessarily instead there's power structure, but, um, you know, a lot of different provisions in there that sets us apart from a lot of the other elected offices in this government. Um, secondly, in response to Councilmember Bukowski's uh, comments, um, I agree. I think the Home Rule Charter needs a lot of work, but I certainly agree uh, with Councilmember Macy. I mean, you can't clump an entire, you know, all of the changes that need done into one ballot referendum. It literally would take up three pages on a ballot. Um, and as someone who works in campaigns for a living, that is true. Explaining these things can be very difficult. So piecemealing it out, unfortunately, unless we were going to scrap the whole thing and start over again, is the best we can do. Um, and third, um, I myself have a couple ballot referendum uh, or potential ballot referendum bills sitting in committee. I'm working on a third. Um, you know, I would like to say that these bills have to be, in order to be placed on the 2023 general election timeline, has to be passed by this body before summer break. So I would urge the chair of government before reform to please, if we can, make a priority of getting those done before we leave for summer break. That would be appreciative. Um, but that's it. That's all I got. So thank you. Anyone else this evening? Harry no or Councilman Kelsey. <laughs> I'm flabbergasted. I mean, I'm, I, I appreciate the zeal of um, all of the ordinances moving through government reform, but I guess I'm, you know, still of, uh, you know, old school that uh, the government that governs best governs least and that we literally don't need a law for everything. And it sure seems like this year, as opposed to my prior first year of service, is uh, we've got the afterburners on and passing ordinances. Uh, but uh, my question though, and I apologize for the, the rambling. So every, can someone explain this uh, committee, the Blue Ribbon Committee that got this, that, because we're in year 23 now, and if it's every 10 years, I mean, shouldn't it have met at least twice? They have? There's two reports? Yes. Yeah. Jared, can you clarify? Uh, the Government Review Commission is required by charter. Its initial meeting was in 2005, and its first report, I believe, was issued either late 05 or early 06. And then 10 years after that, they met in 15, and the, the final report issued, I believe, in March of 16. <clears throat> the 05. Next one will be 2025, correct. They met about five or six years ago, the last committee. So we're getting close to the end here. I'll send it to you, Jeff. Anyone else this evening? Hearing no, Councilman? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> 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 Go ahead, roll call vote, please. <laughs> On the motion to approve. Ms. Bennett. We do. Wait, time out. Don't we have public comments, though? Yes. Yeah. We're not, we're not adjourning. We're, not adjourning. Oh, we're just adjourning this discussion. No. No, on the motion to approve Mr. Macy's bill. <laughs> we're voting on the motion. We're no. voting on the ordinance. Yes. On the motion to approve ordinance 12638 no. 23. Ms. Bennett. No. Thank you. Mr. Bekowski. No. Mr. DeMarco. No. Mr. Dewar. Yes. Mr. Fatulis. Sure. Ms. Hallam. No. Mr. Klein. Yes. Mr. Macy. Yes. Ms. Nacaretti Chapkis. Yes. Mr. Palmieri. Yes. Mr. Palmasina. Yes. Ms. Prizio. No. Mr. Walton. No. President Katina. Yes. Eyes nine, nose five, with one member absent. The bill passes. Okay. Moving on. Notification of contracts. Thank you. We have none. Okay. Public comment on general. We have a couple. Caitlin Moss Crawford. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Katie. I speak tonight regarding conflict of interest issues between police officers and citizens. I bring this to a larger audience in the hopes that awareness will ripple out. Our story is long, but my time is short. 
None of what I speak about tonight is to discount the hard work that dedicated officers do perform. My husband and I work in education and live in Shaler. We have a personal yet negative connection to a police officer. At this time, I am not disclosing the full nature of our connection. In June 2021, we invited this officer to participate in conflict resolution counseling with us, and the response given was that this person doesn't need to be told what he is or isn't going to do. This officer followed us home one night, April 2022, and made claims in our driveway that my husband was drunk driving based off of a smell. My husband was not swerving, speeding, slurring, stumbling, or any other actions one might experience while actually being drunk. A second officer arrived. My husband made the conflict of interest known. Thank you very much. My husband was then handcuffed and put in a patrol car. The initiating officer said they would bring him back when they were done with him, and I was given the time frame of 20 minutes. The officers already knowing that they were going to be bringing him home shows that the accusation was not expected to result in an arrest. My husband passed the sobriety test with near 100% accuracy. All three officers failed to put the breathalyzer re results in their report. Audio and visual recordings, along with photos, will show that the officer's account does not match actual appearances, behaviors, or the timeline of events. We have taken many steps to gain clarity of the officer's prof professional permissions. Information has been denied or redacted. The person handling our request shows an extension of the conflict of interest. Throughout this whole process, we have never requested dis disciplinary action, only understanding of how this event was permitted to occur and why information is being withheld. It is our understanding that this officer is telling others that my husband did get a DUI. Acquaintances of this officer were discussing this event at a school bus stop. This officer has continued to interact with us in various ways, regardless of our request for space. My husband should be able to interact with his children without this officer interfering or making comments regarding intimidation while trick-or-treating. After reviewing various documents, we do not see guidance about conflict of interest. The oath that the officers take does not include anything about the bias of having a personal relationship with someone. We ask all police departments to strengthen or implement policies regarding conflict of interest to prevent further similar issues. While it might take time for revisions to occur, we publicly ask this officer to give us the space we have requested. We are willing to work with policymakers further and welcome further communication about this issue. Thank you so much. Sonia Saylor. Jacob Poole. Good evening, I'm Jacob Poole, formerly of uh, Jakob from Europe. Uh, I was brought here as a child from Eastern Europe alone by myself uh, when I was a little kid in 1996 when I was about 12 years old. Uh, for the last year, I was working for PNC Bank in various different roles, and I was hired in a, into a strange role that made no sense. And uh, during this time, people asked me, Jacob, you have an accent, where are you from? You know, your face looks Eastern European, where are you from? So eventually I said, well, fine, I'm not from Ligonier. And I went to high school in Ligonier, but uh, I'm actually from Eastern Europe. I was brought here as a child. I was in pol European police custody when I was 10 years old. When they told me that they busted a child trafficking ring in an apartment complex where Holocaust surviving Jewish family members were abducted to and held captive and forcibly impregnated after they tracked down extended family of Einstein in Eastern Europe to make Einstein children to sell for money. And it's because Pittsburgh has University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, Westinghouse, Bettis Nuclear Research Laboratory, and National Energy Lab, all in demand of Einstein kids. And there's a lot of military contractors, government contractors in Pittsburgh with extended networks all over the world. And apparently, when people find family members related to Einstein, they manufacture children to manufacture children to sell for money. And I know this because I was in European police custody when I was 10 years old, and they told me all of this because they stamped my birth certificate with River Market. So I'll never forget. My birth certificate, little, birth certificate literally says River Market. And they took me to the apartment complex when I was 10 years old where they showed me women with missing hands 
uh, Jewish, Jewish women and all sorts of difficulties that they busted, they mentioned hundreds and hundreds of children, maybe even thousands, and women that were held captive there for 10 years, manufacturing children, children for sale. And I worked at PNC Bank for the last year, and I disclosed that I was child trafficked from Eastern Europe, and I'm not really from Ligonier. I went to high school in Ligonier, and I was child trafficked to Ligonier using church networks, and the words orphan and refugee and various different things. And so PNC Bank fired me. They fired me because I said I was well, I'm a child trafficking survivor, so I'm currently unemployed. And now I'm saying on my resume that I'm a child trafficking survivor from Eastern Europe, and the Pennsylvania Career Link thinks I need to take that off of there because no one's gonna hire me. So no, it's supposed to be a secret that I was sold for money for slavery, and Pennsylvania doesn't have slavery laws on its state. It doesn't, doesn't Allegheny County doesn't either. Carlos Thomas. Marvin Carter. Motion to adjourn. Oh, from the second man. <laughs> <laughs> Motion to bring us back in all those favor.